And we are back with the Prime Minister and the British person right over there somewhere. I'm over here. Hi, everybody. Yes. And we shall continue the game on Wednesday. Yes, I am sure. Wednesday is an all right day in my book. Yes. Beats Tuesday. Ah, it's now. Ooh, we have a memo. Hmm. Congenital unreliability and pun. Um. Hmm. That's odd. His colleagues are other civil servants. Yes. They. Yeah. Oh. That's a long meeting. Yeah. Like, I have work shifts that don't last that long. Hmm. Um, what's on the... Huh. Oh. Absolutely nothing in the other drawer now. And as a reminder, let's take a look at our numbers. That's Hooray. not too bad a result. Ah, so apparently... There was something... Pressing Sir Humphrey's mind, so let's see if we can catch him. Hmm, okay. Uh huh. Sure, let's go there. Guess it's a but thou must sort of situation. Right. And as before, you were voicing, well, almost everyone else but <laughs> the Prime Minister Hacker. I can get behind that. <clears throat> ah, Prime Minister, how swift you are these days. Thank goodness for someone who realizes the gravity of the Hiram B. Goldbladder problem. Let's maintain a little perspective, Sir Humphrey. The problem is serious, but hardly grave. Well, that rather depends on you, Prime Minister. Impertinence. To put it in a nutshell, the Americans are making threatening noises about dangerous anti-Americanism creeping into British society and politics. And they say they'll withdraw tourist concessions if British politicians continue to badmouth, as their curious phrase goes, the American government's foreign policy. Uh huh. Is that a... I'm used to the phrase badmouthing. Oh, I've heard it before plenty. Yeah, Mr. Goldbladder says he wants to interface with you in London when he arrives next week. Well, that's beyond the scope of this game, so who cares? <laughs> that's really a problem for the next government. Hmm. <laughs> Right, okay, I think number one would be missing the point, rather. Yeah. Oh, why can't he just say, have a meeting? Good question. Maybe he plays too many <laughs> computer games when he should be working. Oh, that's hitting close to home right there. Anyway, we've outlined some contingency options for you. Two, to be precise. That's not very many. How Hegelian and synthetic is the civil service mind? Uh huh. Hegelian is not a word I'm familiar with. Well, uh, something that follows the philosophy of Fried Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Okay. Uh, uh. Okay, well, looks like we get to choose between two bad options. That seems to be the way it goes with this game. Yes. Can fall in Hmm. I'm 
I'm not entirely sure which of those to go for. Well, I would pick number two. I mean, it's, it was something about... What was it? Something to do with... Did he mention something about tourism or something and that... Oh, yeah, tourism taking a knock. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure how much you know, a government official can affect that, since that's more of a something people uh, decide by themselves. Yeah. Now, I would say number two. We'll go for number two, then. Hmm? It's thinking about it. Well, this <laughs> is very so uh, Humphrey. I would say so. Well, what do you mean by tell, Prime Minister? Oh, surely that's obvious. <laughs> Not at all. Well, I mean... Hmm... Ooh! <laughs> Showing him sounds like a good option since I guess showing him with charts and slides and supposed facts and statistics he can't argue with those and it sounds like a job for the civil service that's the best option yes quite right prime minister a simple technique of persuasion tightening the pincer of reason so he can't squeeze out Hmm. Well, that's all very well. But are his threats hollow? Well, surely it's clear that... Uh, you know, there's little thing you can do about American tourism. He knows that we know that there's little... <laughs> we know that he knows there's little... <laughs> okay. Okay, I imagine either of these last two. <laughs> he knows that we know that this little again. We know that he knows this well. Hmm. I think number four. Yes. It, tourism is more of a people thing than specifically it's the foreign office. Hmm. I'm not so sure, Prime Minister. Are you now? But surely it is clear that Goldbladder is in no position to determine whether the Americans spend their holidays here. Yeah. You see, that's our point. Yes. I would say yes, it is yes. clear. Of course it's clear. Our colonial cousins won't deny themselves cream teas and tours around Windsor just at Goldbladder's bidding. So, what's the problem, then? That's what I'd like to know. Very obvious, my dear Bernard. How do we know he knows as little he can do about it? He may think himself more powerful than he really is. Well, that's a point. In that case... I'd say we have nothing to worry about. If he thinks he's more powerful than he is, that yeah, means that he's just going to be full of hot air and make an ass yeah. out of himself. Quite right, Prime Minister. He'll simply be made to look foolish. The King Canute of American tourism, unable to stop the tide of cigar chewing, McDonald's eating, bubblegum blowing seekers after culture. Yes, because they have none of that in America. So his threats are hollow? Of course. Finally. Well, why didn't you say that in the first place? Again, I'd like to know that <laughs> too. I did, Bernard. I did. Uh, uh. <laughs> so we've been taking a look at some of the documentation for this game. Ah, yes. And on the back of the, the manual... Uh, it has uh, back of the game box, I think. Quite right, yes. It, it, it has 
quotes from the writers of the show saying that the game is basically spot on. Yes. And that I can see that scene playing out in the show. Yes. The Hiram Goldbladder meeting the following week was a success. Hacker was firm. The Americans knew where they stood. <coughs> Um, so where do we go? Ah, uh, back to our office, I imagine. Oh. Yeah. Of course, let's... Ooh. Excellent. So... Well, that really did take all morning. I guess now we'll just wait until it's ten past two. Unless something of these devices will. I don't ring. think the game will let us do that. Oh, yes, it does. Um, oh, excellent. Let's check the cabinet secretary's office. So, was it Sir Humphrey or. Ah, yes. Ah, uh, Prime Minister, I had almost given up on you. You're not usually quite so tardy. Ah, blame the game for skipping right to the exact time. Not taking account the time it, it takes in tra transit. Isn't it one minute past? Well, it is when we left the office. Okay. And, hmm. Hmm? Okay, some reason the game is not, seems like it's not always taking, taking the input right away. Ah, well it's acronym time again I'm afraid, Prime Minister. Hmm? You know, Prime Minister. Ah, uh, which means, well, I know this one at least. I know that one. Compromising the initials of other words. Like scuba. Yes. Of course, you knew it all along, sir. I actually did not know scuba is an acronym. It is as far as I'm aware. Hmm. Self contained underwater breathing apparatus. That makes sense. Alas, it's another clutch of education pressure group reports. One from Chalk, one from Dust, and one from Kane. Those all sound like names where you first came up with the initials and then the actual words to make them up. <laughs> it's become a sort of addiction, hasn't it? I'm a firm believer in Acronymics Anonymous. Anyway, you must know them. Chalk is citizens for higher and lower knowledge. Rather pompous title for parents with children at both university and school. See, that's just sloppy. They use the initial for from and, which you usually don't you do when putting up to, to get uh, together an acronym. Because by that tack, they should also have an F in it. Yeah. <laughs> and dust. Don't underfund school teachers straightforward pay pressure group. And Kane cut all new education. Right wing crowd. Fond of corporal punishment. Not so fond of peace studies or gender's consciousness raising. I see. I like the Kane organization that was in Leisure Suit Larry Five. Conservatives against nearly everything. Gender consciousness and raising mean? Uh, I would say it's about. I, yeah. I would say number two. Yes. What? Challenging patriarchal patrimony, subverting the social order. Yeah, let's not go into the whole feminism patriarchy thing. Let's not. And these uh, pressure group reports have come at just the wrong time when we. I mean you, have to consider the method of calculating teachers' pay over the next five years. Wait, five years? Um, 
How long is a prime minister's term in office? Uh, it can be as long or as short as they want, uh-huh. so long as they keep getting voted in. Uh huh. But what I suspect is they want us to set up a five-year plan that whoever is in place has to follow. I see. The Squeers report suggests two possibilities. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Maybe linked to performance or linked to inflation. Well, if you link to any performance, I would say then that runs the risk of, you know, artificially fudging the numbers. Yeah. As is my understanding, in England it works on option two. Yeah. I have teachers in my family, I'm fairly sure it's number two. Yeah, let's go with that. Fairness to teachers, Prime Minister. Do you... Hmm... And is, is priority of teachers or a special case? Well, the second one would imply that we don't really mind if everyone else is treated unfairly, which doesn't sound good. I would say number one. Yeah. Oh, there's that word. As To step back in the show, they mentioned that if you want to turn the Prime Minister away from something... Tell him it is a courageous decision. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Fairness to all groups. Ah, let's go with that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. Fairness to them as group. I'm not even sure where, what the difference is anymore. Me neither. <laughs> uh, it's got two bad options. Uh, let's try society as whole. Yeah. That, that seems okay, I guess. Uh. I agree, Prime Minister. It's simply impossible to talk about fairness in the abstract. It only has meaning when you compare, say, doctor's salaries with teacher's salaries, and ask if both are being fairly remunerated for what they contribute to society. Quite so, I think. Hmm. Let us assume some form of comparability, Prime Minister. The question naturally arises, with whom do we compare teachers? Uh... Hmm... This is well like... I... I would say number one, because at least... in my constituency, librarians are not paid. Mm -hmm. Um... So you can't necessarily compare pay versus performance with somebody who is not paid. And there's a. I'd say there's a lot of variation in. in the wages you get between, say, teachers and pharmacists. This is also true. Uh. And if we compare teacher salaries to librarians who don't get paid. Well, that means the teachers, in comparison, are getting a really good deal. A very good point. <laughs> Let's go with librarians, then. Mm. <laughs> oh, librarians. <laughs> oh, wait, your line. That's okay. Ah, librarians. Those who can do, those who can't teach, those who can neither teach nor do become librarians. Or politicians. Unfair, Humphrey. Surely there are two types of librarian. <laughs> With which should teachers be compared? Um. 
Hmm. I see. I wasn't thinking of the second kind. That's more, you know, clock work to me. Hmm. So, so the, the the first one to me is the voluntary work. Hmm. So maybe number one because it's more social and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, yes, the traffic wardens of the hardbacks. I can think of a few teachers like that. Yes, Humphrey is glad. Hooray! I think. You never can tell. But unfortunately, such librarians don't count for the purposes of comparison because they're usually clerical officers, not graduates. Well, that's not what we were going with, Bernard. I think, Prime Minister, all this talk about comparisons is confusing the issue. Well, I wasn't the one who brought it up, I think. And whose fault is that, Bernard? Come now, Humphrey, let's not go point pointing fingers. <laughs> well, who raised the fairness issue? I didn't. That was the Squeers report. Excellent option. Shift the blame to someone who is not present. <laughs> Quite. Is indexation best because it is... Ooh. <laughs> I think we know the answer to this one. Apparently fair to teachers. That's yeah. how we've been talking around it. Yes. Yes, Prime Minister. Excellent solution. They would find it hard to argue against indexation because it guarantees their standard of living. From our point of view, it is cheap because inflation is falling, administratively convenient, tactically acute because it deprives them of their <laughs> comparative complaints, and politically easy to sell. Hooray! I think this means our support numbers go up. I think you've cracked it, Prime Minister. I'd like to think so, too. <laughs> so, I... Well, is that really going to be all for today? Ooh, another percent. Well... Let's hope nothing else happens. Of course, we are not so lucky. Oh, that would be easy. Hmm. Just to tell you, Prime Minister, I've arranged for a BBC crew to film your reunion with your old landlady. A nice, uncontroversial story. Good for the sentimental vote. And a fill-up to the private rental sector. What's a month's rent compared with all that? Oh, yes, we did have a discussion about the landlady, and we solved it by inviting her to come to, come to our new Nudics at 10 Downing Street. Bernard, you're beginning to sound like Sir Humphrey. Uh, okay, I guess. That's all to say about that. Did that affect anything? No. Apparently not. Um. I guess uh, it's just setting up what's coming up tomorrow. Um. Oh. Now what? Good news, Prime Minister, about that red box. Apparently the East German girl was just an old family friend. Nothing to worry about. Perhaps we could tell the police to concentrate the search. Well, well I... Ah, uh, that was also on the previous day. I think ransacking the defense secretary's home would be a really bad idea. I agree, and he said that he thinks he'll uh, forget the box in the restaurant, and if it's at home, well, he's probably going to find it himself, and then it'll, it'll, it'll be all right. Absolutely. Very well, sir. I did. Uh, no change. No. I feel like that's just setting up something for another day, you know? Could be. And... 
Prime Minister, I've just had the chairman of the BBC on the phone. He's rather upset that one of your back benches has tabled a motion to ban an avant-garde TV drama. I see. Avant-garde. Um... I... Now this one's just personal preference. Yes, but from what I've seen of the show myself, I don't really see Jim Hacker as a guy who goes for avant-garde. No, he's it's a good life and that sort of yes. safe TV show. He's a man of the people, not a pompous artsy type. That sounds ominous, because it is French. Hardly. It means that 90% of the viewing public won't understand it. That too. So, Bernard, why does this play cause our backbench such indignation? Maybe we should get those folks at floor 13 to take care of this play right. Hmm. We can disappear him. Well, the singing parakeet has two and a half seconds of smutty language. <laughs> Dear. Well, first of all, I suppose first question should be, is it aired before or after Watershed? Hmm. Presumably afterwards, because that's what the Watershed is for. Yes. So what... Well, my view entirely. Just because a puritanical backbencher has a private hobby horse, there's no reason for us to start backing it. Yes, on the other hand, remember, Mary Whitehouse did dead get knighted. She did. And I'm never going to let that go. <laughs> <laughs> there were shows that actively tried to annoy her. I support that. Apparently she did manage to get BBC to change their course with Doctor Who. I'm not aware of that one. Uh, apparently it was around when, uh, during Tom Baker's time, where about halfway through or so, and the, it went from more dark and dark stories to more comedy. Ah, okay. Backstage meddling. Yes. Now can we... Yes, we finally got through that day. And what waits, waits us thurs on Thursday? That we shall see in the next video. What do you think? Yes, Prime Minister.